Hello again, class. Today we're going to start a series of lectures uh, about government in action. Uh, so far this semester, uh, we've spent most of our time talking about uh, how the government is structured, three branches of government, how it's put together, uh, how the state governments and federal government share power in our federalism system, uh, those sort of issues. Uh, through the lectures we're going to start with today, we're really going to talk about, um, okay, how do all these laws and government structures actually affect uh, we the people? And vice versa, how do we the people affect government? Today, uh, primarily, this lecture will discuss uh, civic duties. Uh, we'll talk generally about uh, what duties we have as citizens, uh, and then we'll get into some specifics about voting in elections. So again, what is our civic duty? All right, it's it's one thing to think of all right, the government uh, as being the primary actor in, in issues involving government and politics. Uh, but remember, uh, as Lincoln said, uh, ours is a government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Okay. So what are uh, our duties? All right. If the government is, is from us uh, and by us, uh, what, what duties do we as citizens hold? Uh, and we're going to discuss several. Uh, this will not be a comprehensive list. I'm not going to list every single possible civic duty uh, we have, but we're just going to talk about uh, some of the, the more obvious ones. And some of these ones I'll list, uh, we're legally required to do it. Others, we're not legally required to do it, but uh, there may be somewhat of a moral obligation. Uh, if, you know, for those of us living in a democracy, we may have moral obligations to uh, to fulfill certain duties or responsibilities to make sure uh, the government and the democracy continues working for all of us. All right, first, jury service. Uh, now, for the most part, this is a legal requirement. Uh, there are some exceptions uh, for jury service. Uh, if you're older than a certain age, I believe it's 65 or 70. Uh, if you're the primary caregiver of, of a dependent uh, and you can't uh, find you know, babysitting or some other service, things like that. There are several um, exceptions. But by and large, uh, if you get a jury summons uh, that calls you to jury duty, you're legally required to go. Uh, and judges and courts can take action against those uh, who don't show up for duty. This is a law, and you're required to do it whether you want to or not. Similarly, paying taxes. Uh, no one likes paying taxes, uh, but we're all obligated to do it. Uh, there's a amendment to the Constitution specifically says an income tax is allowed, uh, and our government has been taxing uh, and issuing taxes since its inception. Uh, so paying taxes is uh, a legal requirement and therefore a civic duty. Serving in the military. Uh, this is sometimes a legal requirement. Uh, right now, uh, it is not. Now, it is a requirement that uh, at least all males, once they reach 18, uh, sign up, or not not for the military, but you have to register. I think Docs have to join. Uh, but you do have to register for military service in case there is a draft ever implemented again. Uh, the government will kind of know who, who they can draft. Um, in the past, though, uh, large, you know, starting with the Civil War and all the way through uh, the first two, or the First World War, the Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, for a long time uh, in our history, America has had a draft. Uh, and if your name was, was pulled out of the hat, so to speak, uh, military service uh, was no longer a choice. Uh, it became uh, an obligation. Uh, so serving the military uh, is a civic duty. Uh, that at various times in our history has, has been a legal duty as well. Uh, additionally speaking, following the laws. All right? When we talk about our country, um, you know, we talk about it, it, the rule of law is important. If you go back to the very, very first lectures we had, 
uh, this semester, we talked about different forms of government, uh, including uh, governments that I don't think any of us want to live in, tyrannies, um, despots, our autocratic governments uh, where, you know, a king or a czar or, or something like that, a dictator, makes all the laws whether you like them or not. Now, in, in our system, we the people, through representatives, have a, have a big say in making laws. But if we're going to continue having a system, if the system is going to operate as it should, uh, it's our duty to then follow the laws. Uh, if you think back to your eighth grade history class, and we may have mentioned this the very first of our semester, you know, one of the very for, first forms of self-government uh, in the Americas and what became the United States was the Mayflower Compact. All, right? All the pilgrims, before they got off the Mayflower, wrote a compact, wrote a contract saying, we're going to work together uh, to create the laws, and then we're going to follow the laws. All right, So one of the very first forms of self-government in our country, I said, everybody agrees to follow the laws. Uh, voting. Now, this is an optional requirement. We are not legally required to vote. Okay? Uh, and as we'll talk about later in this lesson, um, the, the percentage of people uh, that vote in some elections uh, is, is embarrassingly low at times uh, because voting is not a, re a legal requirement. Now, if we're going to continue having a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, I would argue voting uh, is pretty close to a moral requirement, a moral duty, uh, because how can the people govern themselves if they won't actually participate, if they won't take that responsibility for governing themselves? And so if the people won't govern themselves, uh, then, you know, some other ruler will step into place and govern uh, the people for them. Along those lines, being well informed. Now, again, this obviously isn't a legal requirement. No one is going to make you uh, read or watch the, the news or, or keep up with current events. Uh, however, being well informed goes hand in hand with voting. Uh, how can you make an intelligent choice uh, in, in, your, in your voting uh, if you don't know what the issues are, if you don't understand uh, how government works, what the issues of the day are, the pros and cons of each of those issues. Uh, it's hard to make a well-informed, educated choice if you don't take the time uh, to educate yourself. Uh, so I would argue being well-informed uh, is every bit um, as important as voting, or at least almost as important. Um, because if you're not well-informed, then your vote uh, it becomes somewhat random. Uh, you're just picking a name or, or checking a box on a piece of paper. Now, so if we really want the, the government uh, to run well, uh, then the people who are running the government, uh, and by that I mean the voters, uh, need to be well informed of the important issues. Uh, and finally, and again, this isn't a comprehensive list. This isn't every single possible civic duty we can have. But finally on my list, uh, you know, serving the public good. Uh, this is an optional uh, requirement here I'm talking about, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about more than following laws. I'm talking about taking that extra step uh, to where you help out uh, the country um, in, in certain ways. This can take the, the form of volunteering um, at certain places, giving blood. Uh, I think the most obvious thing we can all think about now uh, as I'm recording this is we're still all in shelter in place uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and following the shelter-in-place guidelines, uh, you know, doing your part not to uh, to spread the disease, to spread germs to others, can be an example of a, a civic duty. Uh, uh, giving blood uh, can be a civic duty. You know, our, our hospitals and blood banks at, at various times need lots of blood donations. Uh, and again, none of these are things we're necessarily required to do. Um, well, sheltering in place at, you know, at certain times has been a requirement. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the issues I'm talking about in terms of serving the public good are not things we're necessarily legally required to do. Uh, but it's thing we may have, a, you know, somewhat of an obligation, a duty to do if we want, uh, you know, to have uh, a, a good and well functioning uh, society and government.
Okay, so that's a brief discussion of our civic duties in general. Now for the rest of this lecture, I want to focus on one specific civic duty we talked about, and that is voting. Uh, this is particularly timely here in 2020, uh, as this is an election year. So let's talk about voting. And before we get into the mechanics of how it, how it works today, uh, let's give a little bit of a history lesson of voting. All right, now this word suffrage, um, you, you may have heard of in your eighth grade history class. You may be learning it in your history class this year. Uh, but, but if not, uh, let's review what suffrage means. Suffrage is just a fancy word for voting rights. And it has expanded in our country, in the U.S., uh, over the last 200 years. Now, initially, uh, and when I say initially, I'm talking about 1780s, 1790s, uh, that time period, uh, you know, right after the Constitution was written and the country began, only white male property owners uh, could vote. And over time, in some cases over a very, very long period of time, uh, those requirements uh, were, were stripped away one by one. Uh, first, in around the 1820s and 1830s, uh, states began eliminating property requirements for voting. Okay, so although in the 1780s, 1790s, uh, not only did you have to be white and male to vote, you also had to own property. Uh, by the time you get into the 1830s and 1840s, that's largely gone. Uh, you don't actually have to own property to vote. Uh, you still had to be a white male, but you didn't have to own property to vote. Uh, then in 1870, after the Civil War in the mid middle of Reconstruction, uh, the country uh, adopted and ratified the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, and this extended suffrage uh, to African-American males. Okay, again, only males. You still had to be a man to vote. Uh, but the 15th Amendment says, okay, we're not going to limit voting based on race. No longer had to be white. Now, as you're probably learning, uh, for those of you who are taking high school history and learning about the civil rights movement, obviously there had to be a lot more work, uh, you know, later in the, into the 20th century to start enforcing the 15th Amendment. Uh, but at least as of 1870, uh, the Constitution extended voting, uh, to all men, regardless of race. All right. Then about 50 years later, the 19th Amendment extends suffrage to women. Okay. Um, you see the picture I have on the screen right here. That is women protesting during the middle of World War I, uh, protesting their, their voting rights. Uh, one of the reasons uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, said America was entering World War I was to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, and so these women are picketing and protesting outside the White House, pointing out, well, we don't have democracy. Uh, if, if America's going off to Europe to fight for democracy, why don't we uh, expand it to everyone here at home? All right. And finally, in 1920, the 19th Amendment is ratified and women uh, get the right to vote. Uh, next, uh, again, another 50 years later, 51 years to be exact, uh, 18, 19, and 20 year olds get the right to vote. Uh, before 1971, uh, again, if you recall from our federalism election, uh, voting and elections are generally run by the states. And so states may have various different age requirements for voting. Uh, but a lot of times it was 21. You had to be 21 to vote. Um, but the 26th Amendment uh, extended the vote to all people, uh, or at least all citizens, 18 years and older. All right. So as of the 26th Amendment, in America, any citizen who's 18, regardless of race or gender, uh, now has the constitutional right to vote. However, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, over the years, uh, there had to be some additional laws passed in order to enforce those constitutional amendments. Well, and in fact, in one of them, 
uh, was the tw another amendment to the Constitution, the 24th Amendment. Uh, this outlawed a poll tax. All right, a poll tax is basically where you charge people uh, to vote. Uh, after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, the 15th Amendment extended voting rights to the former slaves and African Americans. One way uh, states uh, try to basically continue denying the right to vote uh, to the former slaves and African Americans uh, was to make them pay money to vote. Uh, remember, uh, when these African Americans were, were kept in, in slavery, they obviously weren't being paid for the vote. So when slavery ended, they didn't have cash uh, to go pay to vote. Uh, so these were one of the laws passed to, to prevent people from voting. Uh, but the poll tax was outlawed in the 24th Amendment. Uh, then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and subsequent amendments uh, outlawed other certain practices that had been designed uh, during Jim Crow laws in the Jim Crow area to suppress minority voting, things like literacy tests. Uh, again, these literacy tests, because it was illegal uh, during slavery to teach a slave to read, um, most of these former slaves couldn't read. So uh, the former Confederate states passed a lot of laws uh, saying you had to take a literacy test, prove you could read uh, in order to vote. However, what they did uh, was was even uh, maybe even more unfair than, than just what they put on, on the paper because what they did is they gave exceptions to if your, I believe it was your, your grandfather could was eligible to vote. Now, obviously with these former slaves, none of their parents or grandparents had been allowed to vote. Uh, so that exception didn't apply to them. So what, uh, what these Jim Crow laws were designed to do was to make sure uh, that white people could vote, uh, whether they could read or not, because most likely their grandparents had been eligible to vote, uh, but it still denied the suffrage uh, to African Americans. And as you can see, uh, it took about another 100 years after the Civil War uh, before the Voting Rights Act was passed and to start outlawing these Jim Crow practices to extend the right to vote. Okay, uh, that's our history lesson about voting. Now let's talk about just how it works in practice. I've already mentioned and reminded you that Based on our system of federalism, the federal government has certain powers, the state government has certain powers, and running elections is one of the state powers. So therefore, when we talk about, when I talk about these rules and how voting works, I'm going to speak very generally, uh, because these rules, although they're, they're very, very similar, they are, they do have slight differences in the different states. Uh, so just understand when I'm talking about these various voting rules, uh, they're generally guidelines. It's pretty similar in states, uh, but it does slightly different uh, from state to state, uh, with, with the exception of what the Constitution protects. Uh, no state can deny uh, someone the right to vote based on gender or race or, or age as long as they're 18. Uh, those things are set by the Constitution. States have to follow that. Uh, but other rules about registering to vote and where you vote and that sort of thing. That's, that's taken care of by the states. All right. So in every state, uh, except North Dakota, you do have to register to vote. Okay. You just can't walk in uh, to a polling location on election day and vote. Uh, you have to register uh, ahead of time. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, these can be, you know, fairly significant, uh, the deadline for registering to vote can be fairly significant in advance of the election. I mean, it's not too, too far, uh, but as you'll see, I looked up the Texas law, and if you want to vote in this presidential election, uh, and I know some of you uh, who are listening to this lecture will be 18 by next November, by this November. So if you want to vote in this presidential election, which is going to take place on November 3rd, you need to register by October 5th, right? So it's basically about a month in advance. All right? So you can't wait until uh, the day or the day before the election to, to take care of this. You have to be thinking uh, at least a month in advance to make sure you get registered. All right, now, where do you get registered? Uh, there are only certain locations uh, where you can go to get registered. One at the 
County Voter uh, Registrar's Office. All right, so there'll be official voting uh, building in each office in each uh, county that you can go to and pick up an application. Uh, many public libraries, uh, perhaps all public libraries, uh, will have applications. Uh, certain other types of government offices, some high schools. Uh, you can also go online and print out an application. All right, and so you'll see here and uh, this PowerPoint uh, probably be up on Google Classroom. Uh, so you can click on uh, that link and go to uh, find other places to vote or other other rules about the application process. Now, recently, many states have passed IDs uh, requiring an ID. I'm sorry, passed laws requiring an ID to vote. And these laws have been very, very uh, controversial. Okay. Uh, the people in favor of the voting ID laws argue that, well, you know, you, we don't want voter fraud. You don't want, uh, you know, one person you know, voting 10 or 15 times with other people's voter uh, registration cards. You can only be allowed to vote once. Uh, and so requiring an ID prevents fraud. Uh, the people who are against these laws argue uh, that they disproportionately, disproportionately, excuse me, hurt um, elderly voters and minority voters uh, because those uh, groups of voters are somewhat less likely to have a photo ID uh, than other groups. So this is a very controversial issue. Uh, some laws, uh, including Texas, uh, I mean, some states, including Texas, have recently passed laws requiring an ID. Uh, some states have not. Uh, so this is one of those different differences between various states. All right. Now, most people, and this is somewhat changing, but it's still mainly true. Most people vote at a polling location, usually often a school or a rec center in your neighborhood, on election day. Uh, for national elections, election day is always on Tuesday, and so that Tuesday of the election, that's still when most people, usually the before work or after work, uh, they'll go to wherever their neighborhood polling location is. And again, this is something you probably need to look up ahead of time, uh, but it's usually at a, a school or a recreation center. Think places like that and go vote on election day. Uh, however, uh, recently, you know, more and more people are voting during what's called the early voting period. Uh, so as I said, and as we'll, I think I'll actually put on a future slide here in a minute, national elections are always the first Tuesday in November, unless I believe that first Tuesday falls on November 1st. But let's just pretend that's not the case. So let's just go with the first Tuesday in November. Uh, that's when the actual official election day is. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you can vote for a week or two prior to election day. You can go to the polling location um, and vote early. And vote, early voting, uh, at least in Texas, usually ends, I believe, the Friday before election day. Uh, so, <clears throat> so in other words, if election this upcoming election is going to be on November third on a Tuesday, uh, early voting will probably end whatever that that Friday is. I don't know that for a fact, but that's usually about how it works. Next, some people will what we call absentee uh, vote. Uh, they'll get a ballot, uh, fill out their ballot, and, and mail it in. And this is usually for, for people uh, who are going to be away on Election Day. Uh, I think certain members in the military may have to vote this way. Or if you can't get to the polls, again, this is, um, you know, if for some reason you're not physically pe physically able to go to the polling location, um, you can vote absentee. And there's a lot of talk, uh, and as I'm recording this here in April, we'll have to see how it plays out over the next six months. Uh, but there's a lot of talk to really expand uh, the ability of people to vote by mail. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, we're in. Uh, it's not clear. Uh, we don't know yet um, how safe people will feel going and standing in line uh, to vote come November. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk as to whether uh, mail-in ballots are going to be allowed or not. Uh, 
I'm not sure we have a final answer to that. It may be several weeks or months before we, we know for sure. Uh, but that is, is an issue uh, to pay attention to. All right, now let's talk about various aspects of election. My guess is most of the people listening to this have not voted before. I'm not sure if any of you uh, are 18, had turned 18 by the time of the primary election, although a few of you may have. So a few of you may have voted in the recent primary elections, uh, but most of you probably haven't voted before. And so you probably imagine when you vote, you, you get a piece of paper or, or sometimes if it's through an electronic device, it just kind of shows on a screen and there's a big list of names and you bubble in uh, the little oval beside a name or you punch the button beside the name, however it works. Uh, there's something called straight party voting. And that's where if you don't want to go through, you know, the 30 or 40 uh, different uh, candidates uh, or uh, different elections uh, being taking place that day, uh, you can just vote for a particular party. Uh, because on, especially on the national presidential election, you're not just voting for the president, you're voting on a, oftentimes a senator, uh, you're certainly voting on the House members, you're voting on many, many local elections, uh, judges, governors, mayors, um, state representatives, county commissioners, all sorts of, of different positions are up for election. And so some people don't want to go to the trouble of, of bubbling in uh, you know, little bubbles uh, beside 30 or 40 different names. So they just straight party. And if you do that, you bubble in just like I, I've shown on the screen here. All right, you bubble in uh, one of these two. And that means that every Democratic candidate that automatically votes for either every Democratic candidate on the ballot or every Republican candidate on the ballot, depending on which one uh, you vote for. Uh, another type of election where you're not voting on a person, uh, you're voting on an issue. These are called referendums. Uh, and a, a referendum is where it can be a state, sometimes it can be a county or a city. Ask the voters to decide on a course of action. A lot of times you see these with spending um, issues you know, here in Dallas County. You know, Dallas uh, may have a, a, a referendum that says, okay, should we raise money to build, you know, three more high schools, you know, to build another highway, something like that. And you're voting, uh, not on the person that's going to make the decision, but you're actually voting on the decision. And so you vote either yes or no uh, as to whether the county or the government takes that particular action. That's the subject of the referendum. Now, as I already explained, there are national elections, uh, take place in November. It's every other year we have a national election, basically even number years. So here in 2020, we will have a national election. Again, it takes place the first Tuesday in November. Now, every four years, so in other words, every other one of those national elections, we vote for president. Right, and how it comes, if you look at the last two digits in a year, like this is 2020, uh, so those last two digits are 20, if that year is divisible evenly by four, uh, then it's a presidential election. Year. All right. So we have presidential election years in 04, 08, 12, 16, 20, 24, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are the ones uh, that draw the most attention, uh, that receive the most votes. Um, but uh, as I said, we have elections every two years. We only elect the president every four years, but we have elections every two years. And those elections that take place uh, in between voting for president, those are called midterm elections, all right? Because they're they're halfway in the middle of the president's term in office. And, and during those elections, you still have to vote for House members, all right? Congress persons, and I'm not talking about senators, uh, but members of the House. They only have two year terms, so you have to vote for them every two years. Right? Now, senators, uh, they have six year terms, but each state has two senators. All right. So one election, you'll, you'll vote for, for one Senate spot. Uh, in two years, you'll vote for uh, the other Senate spot. And then two years after that, you just won't vote for either of your senators because they're both still in their six year period. And then the cycle 
uh, repeats itself. Uh, so in every national election every, that we have every two years, basically one third of the senators are up for election uh, and every House member is up for election. However, as we just saw here uh, in, earlier in the spring of the semester, uh, at least before everything sort of shut down uh, for the pandemic, uh, before you have your big national election, you have to have what's called a primary election. Uh, and that's to prevent you uh, from getting to election day and there being you know, 50 different people running for, for president or running for senator. And basically what happens is the the political parties uh, hold primary elections and all the members of that party who want to run for a particular office run against each other. And basically, if you're a voter uh, in that party, uh, you vote on which of those uh, candidates you want to be the official uh, nominee in the, the fall. OK, so, you know, at one point, there were probably 15 Democrats running for uh, president uh, this year uh, through a series of elections. Uh, and they're not they're not all finished yet, as I'm recording this. But through the series, we had a series of primary elections and Joe Biden uh, was winning, picking up the most votes uh, in these elections. And it looks like he will be the Democratic nominee. And now the Republicans were doing this as well, but but no one's going to seriously uh, challenge a, a sitting president within his or her own party. And so those when you have an incumbent president, those really don't get much attention because with very, very few exceptions in our nation's history, uh, the incumbent president gets his party's nomination. Right. And those are called primary elections. And they basically decide who the candidates uh, will be uh, that run against each other in November. Now, in addition to national elections, uh, you have state, county, and city elections that also regularly occur. Uh, now, a lot of times, these national elections, I said, every other year in the first Tuesday in November. Uh, I know Dallas County seems like a lot of their county elections uh, for school board members, city council uh, members, judges, mayors, uh, that sort of thing. These are local elections, maybe not judges, uh, but mayor, city council uh, people, those types of elections. Uh, Oftentimes, those take place uh, in the spring, and a lot of times they occur on a Saturday. Uh, so it's November, you know, the first Tuesday in November is not the only time uh, we vote. Uh, city, county, state, uh, they'll have elections at, depending on where you live, various times and various years. Uh, so there's usually an opportunity to vote um, quite often uh, between primary elections and national elections every two years, local elections, uh, you're usually not going to go uh, very long without being able to vote on, on some, something. Somewhere. Now, let's talk about voter turnout. In 2016, uh, there's a presidential election year. That was Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Only 55% of the voting age population in America voted. All right, so you're talking about People who are 18 year, citizens, 18 and older, only 55% of them voted. And that's a, a, in a presidential election year. In midterm elections, the number is much, much lower, usually. All right, so if you go back to 2014, that was a midterm election. Only 36% of the voting age population voted. All right, so basically two thirds uh, of our fellow citizens I didn't bother to go vote uh, in 2014. Uh, they let other people uh, make the decisions as to who would be their senators and representative members, et cetera. Now, I will say I went back to 2014 to show you the difference between uh, the presidential election year and a midterm election year. And as you can see, uh, you know, it dropped about 20 percent. Right? A lot more people will vote in a presidential election year, uh, but not in the midterm election. The reason I went back to 2014 was because in 2018, uh, I believe it was right around 53 percent of the people voted. It was much closer to an, a national a presidential election year. Uh, we can 
surmise why that was, but you know, I don't think it's a secret uh, that um, people have very strong feelings uh, about the current president, President Trump, uh, one way or the other. Uh, and so in 2018, the first midterm election uh, when he was in office, that uh, the percentage of voters uh, actually stayed pretty similar to what it had been in 2016. Um, we'll have to see if this is a trend that continues in other midterm election years. Well, obviously, in 2020, uh, we're going to vote for president. Uh, we don't know who's going to win yet, uh, but we'll have to see in 2022, the next midterm election, uh, whether a you know relatively high percentage of people vote or whether it fall down, falls down again uh, like it traditionally has. Uh, so that's a trend to keep a watch on here in a couple of years. Now, I will say uh, in the... These are for national elections. Uh, the further away you basically get from a presidential election, uh, the lower the voter turnout. Uh, voting turnout for local mayors and city council per people, uh, the percentage of people in that county or city voting may not come anywhere close to 36 percent. I mean, it can be really, really voting, uh, which means the people who do vote, uh, their vote ends up counting a lot uh, because there just simply aren't that many other people voting. All right. Uh, let's talk about uh, what is always a controversial topic, uh, one that generates lots of anger and arguments and controversy. Who pays for elections? Uh, because running for office is very, very expensive. All right. In 2016, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, uh, as well as their supporters. And I'll talk about what that phrase means here in a minute. Uh, they spent somewhere between one point seven and $2.4 billion. All right. I looked on a couple different news sites and, and websites, and um, I got different figures, uh, but they're in, they're all in this general range. All right. So there was roughly in the last presidential election, roughly between 1.7 and $2.4 billion spent on the election. Um, obviously that is a staggering number and someone has to come up with that money somehow. However, that was just for that one election between those two people. Uh, we as a country spent another four billion dollars on congressional races. All right. So senators, House of Representatives, members, et cetera. Uh, and then on top of that, all those other smaller races I talked about, mayors, judges, governors, uh, state legislatures, uh, more and more money spent on those as well. Uh, so you can see we spend a lot, a lot of money on Now, the question is how and who pays for all of this? One, and the easiest to understand, is simply direct donations. All right, people or companies simply make a direct donation to a campaign or a political party. All right, so if there's a political candidate uh, that you like, uh, you can you know, write that person a check. Well, I'm sure now they're receiving money by Venmo, or PayPal, or other uh, more modern methods. Uh, but you can simply give that candidate money. Uh, now, there are all sorts of rules about what that candidate uh, can do with that money. All right. Um, the candidate can't just put it in their bank account, their personal bank account, and use it you know, to buy Christmas presents or anything like that. Uh, they have to spend on the campaign. And there are also limits. All right, a person can't simply write a million-dollar check to a candidate. Um, I think the, generally speaking, before you get into exceptions and things, uh, the limit, I believe, for a single individual writing um, or giving money to a single individual candidate, I believe, is $2,600. Uh, but there are a lot of workarounds and exceptions to that, as we're going to learn. Now, there's also saw something called public financing. And these are for presidential elections, and the federal government will fund part of a candidate's campaign. However, if the candidate agrees to limit campaign spending. Now, up until 2004, uh, candidates uh, would accept this public financing. However, in 2008, uh, then candidate Barack Obama uh, rejected public financing and just used the money uh, that he was able to raise himself. Uh, 
But since he did that, there weren't limits to how much he could spend. And he ended up spending twice as much as his opponent, uh, John McCain, who had accepted public financing and therefore the limits that come with it. All right. So since that election, uh, no presidential candidate has accepted public financing. Uh, so we'll have to see in the future if, if they change this uh, or if this is just going to simply become obsolete. Uh, and finally, uh, something controversial, political action committees or PACs. Uh, now, these are independent groups uh, that supposedly uh, do not coordinate with campaigns, but they can spend as much as they want in favor of candidates for issues. All right. So if you have a candidate, um, and let's just, you know, you use a name, you know, John Doe. Uh, if candidate John Doe is, is running for president, um, there are rules into how much money he can receive from individuals and corporations and that sort of thing. However, uh, say I really like uh, John Doe. You know, there's nothing to stop me, uh, you know, except my own personal finances, of course. Uh, but, you know, if I have an extra million dollars uh, sitting around that, that I feel like using uh, to help John Doe, I can set up a political action committee. And that political action committee can spend as much money as it wants in favor of John Doe. So that's why when you see campaign commercials, sometimes you know, there will be John Doe and you'll say, I'm John Doe. I'm John Doe and I approved of this message. Those are commercials for uh, and paid for by the candidate themselves. But you also have a lot of commercials that are paid for by PACs, our political action committees, uh, who will basically be, and these can, commercials will try to show, oh, this opponent of John Doe, he, he or she is terrible and they're going to do all these bad things. And those political action committees uh, can spend as much money as they want. Uh, and that was decided by the Supreme Court in a case called Citizen United versus Federal Election Committee. Uh, the case was decided probably about 10 years ago or so. And it ruled that the First Amendment protects PACs' ability to spend as much as they want. Basically, it said spending money uh, is basically a form of a type of speech uh, because you're showing your opinions by, by the money you spend, by advertisements you, you put out there, et cetera. Uh, and so this is protected by the First Amendment. So no one can tell the local action committee not to spend their money. Uh, now, there are rules. You, they're not allowed to coordinate with the candidates. All right. So John Doe can't call up the local action committee and say, hey, I want you to run a commercial in this city at this time of day uh, that says this about my opponent. Uh, candidates aren't allowed to do that. But these political action committees that support candidates uh, can otherwise spend as much money as they want, uh, which is how you end up, which is how you know billions of and billions of dollars are being spent on elections nowadays. And that's why in this first slide on this topic, I said, you know, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, comma, and their supporters. Uh, because the candidate can't necessarily spend the money directly themselves, but uh, very friendly political action committees can. Okay, uh, that's the end for this lecture. Uh, my next lecture will talk about political.